actually telling us to remember Lord's wife. That is in Luke 17, 32. It says, likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. And verse 32, remember Lord's wife. But for all of us at Daystar, and for my students and even my lecturers, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. I want you to reflect on that as, as we go into this devotion. Very interesting passage. And I want you to reflect on this and I'll be asking for your opinions on what this scripture is saying. Remember Lord's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. Sorry about that. Uh, so what is the story of Lord's wife about? Uh, <clears throat> Lord, his wife and two daughters were visited by two angels who urged them to flee the city of Sodom before its imminent destruction by God. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah, those rebellious characters. As they fled, Lord's wife disobeyed the angel's command to not look back and was turned into a pillar of salt. And I, I keep on asking myself, of all the epic women in the Bible, why did Jesus tell us to remember her? Why, is he, why are we asked to remember Lord's wife? And I have been attending a lot of women conferences. They ask me to go for mentoring for almost 40 years now. And I can honestly say I've never had a message on remembering Lord's wife. Even in women conferences, nobody talks about Lord's wife. And yet of the possible 150, is that the spelling of chicks, the young men here? Mentioned in the Bible, of all the possible 170 women or chicks mentioned in the Bible, she is the only one that Jesus ever told us to remember. Just think about it. Of all the women mentioned in, in some way in Scripture, Jesus only ever told us to remember one. And he doesn't even give us her name. She's just Lord's wife. Now, I think I would have been offended if I was one of the other women mentioned in Scripture. Imagine if you were Eve, our mother. She's been think she would be thinking, what do you mean? Remember Lord's wife? I was the first woman and I came from a rib. And basically I've been I've been being blamed for all the problems of humanity ever since I arrived. You remember the story in the Garden of Eden. Or what about Sarah? She popped out a kid at 90 without an epidural. Surely we should be remembering her. Isn't she worth remembering? Or Esther? who stopped the Jewish genocide. We know the story of Esther. Or even Deborah, who was the first female judge of Israel. Lord's wife must have something to teach us if Jesus does not tell us, does not tell us to remember any other woman but her. By the way, Lord's wife is mentioned once, I think, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament once. The truth is, Lord's wife gets one cameo in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament. That's it. That's all that scripture records about this woman. And yet Jesus tells us to remember her. So why would Jesus tell us to remember a woman 
who appears on the pages of scripture only long enough to disappear. Or a woman who's got like the shortest bio ever. We don't even know her name. A woman whose name we don't even know. I have often thought, Jesus, why this woman? And uh, that's why I'm sharing this with my community. Why couldn't you give us more details about this woman if we are supposed to remember her? What is it about her that we are supposed to remember? What exactly did this chick do? By the way, is that the spelling of chick? I don't know. Or is it C-E-E-C-K? Oh, that yeah? is the correct spelling, bro. <laughs> so what exactly did this chick do or this ma this woman do this mother do Jesus is just warning us today Jesus I mean she's just she she is Jesus sorry warning us today So she is Jesus warning to us today we can, like Lord's wife, even see God's evidence, his fruit in our lives, yet still get sullen, annoyed, offended, angry, to the point we refuse to move forward in God. I also want you to tafakari komandi shihaya. She is Jesus, Jesus warning to us today. We can, like Lord's life, wife, even see God's evidence, his fruit in our lives, yet still get sullen, offended, angry, bitter, to the point we refuse to move forward in God. I'll be summarizing and saying we must move forward. So, some of you are not even seeing the good evidence that uh, you have entered a program that has so clearly stated objectives and purpose that this is a this is a program you will benefit from not just to get a master's degree but be enriched with a lot of knowledge uh, some of us then begin to complain about trivials instead of to the point we refuse to move forward in God, because God tells us to appreciate and to love and to value. So with a running cry to remember Lord's wife, it motivates us to stop looking back. It motivates us to stop looking back. Let go and move forward into what God promises in our lives. I think that is beautiful. Very beautiful. It motivates us to stop looking back, to let go and move forward into what God promises for our lives. This call will equip us to stop looking back and start looking to Jesus, invite Jesus to help us let go of whatever is holding us back, that bitterness, uh, that anger, that laziness, that giving up attitude, that hopelessness. And uh, it, it will equip us to step into God's plans, purposes, and promises. I am going to finish my master's in leadership and policy studies at Daystar. I think for me, this is the bigger picture. Uh, I uh, and um, what what this someone is telling us, sorry, is that uh, step into God's bigger picture in life, plans and and promises. You are not here by accident. This is God's plans for you. God's plan for you. You are getting married, you are having children, you are with a project at home. It's all God's plans, purposes, and promises for you. So my students, let this be your year to not look 
back, but to trust Jesus and the Lord with our future and to boldly follow him into the opportunities and plans we simply don't yet see. I want to emphasize that. Uh, you don't even know why you are doing this course. But later on in life, you'll become to realize, oh, see, so this is what God was saying. The opportunities and plans we simply don't yet see. So this was my opening a devotion to my senators, to my management. And uh, I thought we would also start with this class uh, just to let everybody remember Lord's wife. And uh, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. I also want you to note that uh, this, remember Lord's wife, Lord's wife is Jesus' warning to us today. We can, a Lord's wife, even see God's evidence, his fruit in our lives, yet still not be thankful, sullen, angry, offended, stubborn, obstinate, to the point we refuse to move forward in God. So me, I think, our being told to remember Lord's, life, uh, Lord's wife motivates us to stop looking back, to let go, and to move forward into what God promises for our lives. And so for me, this will then equip us to step into God's plans and purposes and promises for our lives and grasp the opportunities and plans we simply don't yet see. So that's my devotion, but I would like to uh, us to react to it as a as a as a congregation and uh, tell me what your perception is here. Um, I'm trying to, to participants, um, Maureen Gunjiri and Boaz Waruku, please go ahead. And then, uh, Othello. Okay. <clears throat> So good evening. Good evening to you. So, so today's reading has really encouraged me because uh, being one of the JSS teachers, we are really going through a very difficult time. But uh, today someone told us that we should stop looking at the negative things all the time. You're complaining, oh, the syllabus is changing, the curriculum is changing. The subjects are being incorporated. We still have the old books. But someone told us to appreciate where we are so that we can be able to move forward. And so when we are reminded today about Lot's wife, we it comes back to me because most of us were complaining because we are still in internship. Our contracts were not renewed. But... The workload has become more now because we have grade eight. But we are reminded to stop looking at what is holding us back. And that for me is very encouraging because if we don't appreciate where we are, we can't move forward. And thank you. Okay, very well, very well. Thank you very much. Uh, Boaz? Thank, thank you, Prof, and thanks uh, to everyone. I'm happy to be back in class. I know I started yesterday. Um, the devotion, uh, right? 
even from yesterday, but uh, today is, is also very spot on. And uh, today it's coming uh, really back on the heels of a conversation I was exposed to earlier in the day in a mm -hmm. meeting, uh, trying to trace uh, innovation in the world, uh, where, who invented what, and uh, a lot of uh, material was pointing at uh, these nations or nationalities who were domiciled in Africa, in the north, and things like that. And uh, it also pointed out that uh, some of the very uh, challenging moments that uh, these innovators were going through. And uh, uh, in a nutshell, it just became apparent mm -hmm. that uh, the ability of uh, the African, so to say, uh, actually to innovate and create things is enormous. I think uh, the discussion went to the kingdoms that we also had in Africa. Uh, why am I uh, going there? Because I think I, I've just discovered that a lot of that conversation was glorifying the past so much. And in other words, then we are stuck in the past for quite some time. But I think the devotion today is uh, telling us, uh, you know, remember remember uh, Lord's wife. For me, the, the, that, that uh, pictorial, of just turning to look back and maybe getting stuck there. So you get stuck in the back. I think that is really telling because it shows us that uh, whatever is gone, whatever is done behind, that is behind us. And so looking ahead, I think we should be looking uh, more straight, uh, very refreshed in a very clear manner. But then, as a prof, you were talking about this, mm -hmm. I, I also started asking myself, what do we mean by life? Because mm -hmm. when yeah. you say whoever, whoever <laughs> tries to keep it, they will mm -hmm. lose it. Uh, is life something that you can lose and still continue living? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, of course, I know what uh, the meaning I get out of it. Maybe you could also try and uh, okay. help us on that. that. Thank you. That's that's interesting. Thank you very much. I've come to that, boss. Uh, Chris Wakesa. Thank you, Prof. Uh, good evening and good evening to colleagues. Yeah, good evening. Um, Prof, I look at Luke 1732 and uh, I see a paradox. Looks to me that this is a paradoxical statement which uh, spiritually may not be understood unless we discern the spirit of the Lord. This is my brother Boaz has said, what is the real meaning of life? Because then how are we going to gain by letting things go? But then it reminds me that um, then for me to move forward, for me to move to the next step, and as you've clearly stated, that uh, moving into God's plan, purpose and promises, then I have to let go of my past. I have to forget about my past so that I'm able to get into the promises of God. Then I then ask myself, what are these promises of God that uh, I'm talking about? Psalms 91 reminds me of a few promises that God gives to the man. And it says, when you call on me, I'll rescue you. I will protect you. I will answer you. I'll walk with you in times of trouble and I will deliver you. And therefore, I'm reminded of the fact that God promises me uh something good but only happens when i've let go of some of the things that may lead me not to attain the promises of god and so a paradox yes but a challenge that i have to take up and gain whatever i want to gain by letting go of some things especially which makes me comfortable which makes me uh stay in my dogmatic slumber thank you prof Good, uh, very good thinking. Uh, Othello, then I'll make a comment, then we go to our class. Thank you, Prof. 
first of all, Happy New Year to everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. And I first want to say congratulations, Prof. and Desta University, on the many, many milestones that were achieved in the just concluded year, 2023. Uh, the many plans that Prof. has put into place and with his team in Desta, they are just coming to fruition. We, my prayer is that Prof. will actually complete what he has started. And, uh, God is going to give you the strength in the university and all the team that you work with in the university, including our sponsors and supporters abroad with whom you have so much, you have cemented that kind of relationship to achieve what has been achieved in this time. We just thank God for what is happening. And then in your personal capacity, also your personal achievement, and uh, we praise God for what he's doing in your life. And now looking at the scripture that we have just read, uh, I see that scripture does not contradict itself. It's so amazing how scripture is connected all over the place in the Bible. And Jesus keeps, this is a reminder, this is a both a warning and a reminder that Jesus is giving to us. If you read Matthew, you look at Matthew 30, Matthew 24, which is a major, major text in the Bible of end, about end time when Jesus was speaking in that, it is also mentioned here. And uh, just like the Lord is saying that you do not know when your master is coming, you have to be ready. You have to be prepared. So this scripture is saying that it's a warning that we, we should focus on Jesus, we should focus on God and not look behind. Because uh, Lord Wise is an example of looking behind and disobeying God's command. Because it was clear command that we should not look back. And when she looked back, the consequences were there for us to see. And she turned into a pillar of salt. We didn't know that when, when God, when the angels warned that we should not look back, the angels did not say, what is going to be, you see that you do not look, you should not look back. So the result came when she looked back. That is now the pleasure of the world. This is a warning about getting stuck with the pleasures of the world and the material things of the world. It's, it's the same statement that is now loaded in a, in a verse here, verse 33, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. That is what the scripture is saying there. It's a very loaded statement. But it's about the pleasures of the world and worldly things, getting stuck with worldly things and not being rich towards God. Because the same scripture is talking about uh, where you are, your treasure is, that is where your heart will be. So your treasure should be in heaven. And that's what we are, we are seeing here in this scripture. And so Prov is talking about about 40 years of trying to wonder about this particular statement. This woman is, is just mentioned, as Prov has said, just twice in the Bible, in the Old Testament, then the New Testament. She does not have that kind of uh, uh, profile or biography that people can read, you know, like the other women we talk about in the Bible, like Esther, like Ruth. So this, this woman is just a warning in the Bible. So according to me, my, my perception on this particular scripture, it is a warning for us to focus on God, as Prof has put it. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Uh, we will uh, close there for comments, but I just want to say, and, and I'll use a very simple example. When it says that whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. Let's take the where you are now as a master's student. If you don't give your life, if you don't give your heart and soul to this program, you'll lose it with the kind of grades that you'll get out of it or the kind of knowledge you'll accumulate having gone through this course. Why? Because you don't want to punish yourself with hours and hours of reading. 
The whole of Friday, I never left the house. I was marking all your assignments. And I went through all of them in the two courses I taught you. And some of you did amazing work. But some of us were just trying to be efficient. That uh, prof wants assignments, so you scribble things and you send them in. So whoever tries to keep their life uh, enjoying, not reading, you lose it. But whoever loses their life, loses their sleep, uh, you know, struggles to, to move from one place to another to attend classes, uh, pairing up to do assignments, you're actually losing the better part of life. You will preserve it because you'll get the grades, you'll get your master's, and God will bless it because he will have seen the labor you would have put into it. Likewise, I tell my fellow, I was telling my fellow colleagues that um, if you try to give little, if you try to cheat life, you don't prepare adequately, you don't give students enough work, uh, you know, you avoid too many assignments because of marking, you are trying to keep your life, but you lose it. But if you sacrifice to teach this class and uh, give it your best and help these students publish papers, you will have preserved yourself because you will have, first of all, developed a relationship with a, a huge constituency of over 50 students. You never know what life brings before us, but also professionally, you'll have made a point as a good lecturer. So we can use very simple live examples, but if we go in the spiritual realm, it just says that when you go to the Mecca, <laughs> please go when you are empty. Empty yourself. Yes. Go to him and say, I, all the brains you gave me, all the energy you gave me, I gave it back for your kingdom. So you are going empty, but you will reap the fruits of heaven. Uh, that is my prayer to all of you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening with thanksgiving. Just having taken care of us throughout the holiday season, the festive season, the season when the angels saw the stars and you were born in Bethlehem, Lord. We continue thanking you for who you are in our lives. And Lord, in our devotion today, you have asked us to remember Lord's wife and stop looking back and move forward in your purposes, in your plans that you have for all of us. We are asking for a smooth semester, but Lord, give us the mindset, give us the spirit to give our all, both students and lecturers, so that not a contradiction, we will have preserved ourselves because we will have lifted your image with the kind of scores we'll get in this course and uh, the professors with having enabled students to graduate in record time. So be with us, not just now, but throughout the night and uh, throughout the semester and throughout the year and in many more years to come. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, so I had asked for uh some time before we start looking at um, 
aspects, winding up aspects of research, there were obvious sections that uh, I needed to cover. Uh, for me to be satisfied that uh, we have done a good job in our research methods class. And I hope you can see the slides there. Um, and uh, I would like to I would like to just revisit. Remember, we were looking at designs, and uh, I told you that um, you are going to encounter many designs. Uh, and uh, we covered that. And, and we even went into hypothesis, but I, I feel I need to talk about uh, just revisit hypothesis so that we know what they are. Now, the purpose of a hypothesis is to test. or to determine whether there's enough statistical evidence in favor of a certain belief about parameter. All I'm saying, a hypothesis is an educated guess. It is a hunch that you think this will happen. And uh, you are saying that this, this variable will behave like this. So in hypothesis testing, you are simply determining the truthfulness of a given theory, a given idea, a given belief. So a hypothesis, sorry, is a tentative explanation or postulate by the researcher of what you consider or he considers the outcome of an investigation will be. It is a guess. So for example, you can form a hypothesis and say, and let me just escape here to illustrate something. You can say, for example, that um, we are seeing that um, we are seeing that um, performance is a function. of facilities and teacher capacity and teacher capacity. You see, this is a hypothesis, not see why. This is a hypothesis because performance is the variable. is the outcome. We have just seen people dancing in schools when the results came out, performance. And I hope my good students of research, you know that this is the DV. This is the dependent variable, the outcome. Is a function of facilities and teacher capacity. 
facilities and teacher capacity. So facilities and teacher capacity is your independent variable, your IV. So what is the hypothesis here? We are saying performance relates to facilities and teacher capacity. So a hypothesis is a preliminary or tentative explanation or postulate by the researcher of what you consider or what the researcher considers the outcome of an investigation. It is an informed or educated guess. So what you are doing yourself is you are going out, you are going out there to test the hypothesis. This is your dependent variable. These are your independent variables. Uh, in fact, um, sorry. Uh, this should be IVs. This should be the IVs. This should be the IVs. And, and uh, by the way, this looks simple, but I don't want you, I want you to conceptualize it and not to memorize it. What is a hypothesis? It is an educated guess. It is a hunch. It is, it is your tentative explanation. Then you go out in the field and you collect data around performance in a school. You look at the teacher capacity. Here, teacher capacity means the number of teachers and their training. And then you look at the facilities, laboratories, uh, textbooks, and so on. It indicates the expectations of the researcher regarding certain variables. So here you can see my expectation is that performance is a function of facilities and teacher capacity, or performance is determined by facilities and teacher capacity. It is the most specific way in which an answer to a problem can be stated. So what are we saying? We are saying is a tentative statement about a population parameter. Now, sorry, please note this. When we talk of a population parameter, what are we saying? We are talking about a variable. A variable. Uh, so we are looking at the parameter here is performance. And we are saying it is determined by teacher capacity, but also determined by facilities. That could be true or wrong. So normally, in research, we actually test, we actually test the hypothesis. I want you to note that we actually test the hypothesis in research. Testing the hypothesis. That is what we do. And we want to know whether the hypothesis stands or does not stand. Is it true or not true? The difference between a hypothesis and a problem. Note that both an hypothesis and a problem contribute to the body of knowledge which supports or refutes an existing theory. I want you to note that people who do hypothesis 
people who test hypotheses, they're actually wanting to prove an existing theory, an existing fact. That is what a hypothesis is intended to do. So I would like, again, as my students of research methods, to note that we are doing these things in order to test the validity of a theory. And uh, you are going out there to test. You are not if and and so this is quantitative. It is not qualitative. If it was qualitative, you are going to develop a theory or an idea or a concept, a conceptual framework. Now, a problem is formulated in the form of a question. It serves as the basis or origin from which a hypothesis is derived. But a hypothesis or an hypothesis is a suggested solution to a problem. So like here, we said that if you want performance, you need facilities and teacher capacity. So that is, this is what I want you to note that a hypothesis is a suggested solution to a problem. A problem or a question cannot be directly tested, but a hypothesis can be tested and verified. And I think we spend a lot of time on the problem statement. An hypothesis is formulated after the problem has been stated and the literature study has been concluded. In other words, you can't come and tell us you are testing a hypothesis if you have not done the literature to tell you the theory you're going to test. And it is formulated when the researcher is totally aware of the theoretical and empirical background of the problem. What is the purpose and function of an hypothesis. So it offers explanations for the relationship between those variables that cannot be empirically tested. It furnishes proof that the researcher has sufficient background knowledge to enable him or her to make suggestions in order to extend existing knowledge. It gives direction to an investigation and it structures the next phase in the investigation and therefore allows us to continue examining the problem. And please remember, hypotheses are engaged in essentially in quantitative studies, quantitative studies. What are characteristics of an hypothesis? It should have elucidating power. So sometimes when I use such big words, pick it up and quickly learn what is an elucidating power. Um, so you should not just leave it there. Elucidating. You see what I've done? I've highlighted and gone to the theosaras. So clarifying, explaining, explicating expounding, illuminating, revealing, exposing. That's what a hypothesis does. So again, as a master student, never jump over words you don't understand. That's why I told each of you to have a laptop and an internet. You highlight and you right click and then you go to Theosaras and it will tell you the meaning. It should strive to furnish an acceptable explanation of the phenomenon. 
So if the phenomenon is performance, it must give us an, ex an acceptable explanation. What factors contribute to performance? And here we have said teacher capacity and facilities. There could be other factors like the economic uh, status of the family. You saw how many students from private schools made it to national schools. So the economic status of the family could be another factor. It must be verifiable. In other words, we must be able to prove it right. And it must be formulated in simple, understandable terms. And it should correspond, not corresponds, but it should correspond to uh, existing knowledge. Types of hypothesis, I told you, I will come to this later when I'm, when I'm helping you write your proposals. But um, generally at master's level, I would be talking about just two hypotheses when I'm helping you write your proposal. That is the, the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. Uh, these are more detailed for at PhD level, which we don't get in there. So you will worry about this hypothesis, the null hypothesis at this level. And uh, this hypothesis always tells us there is no relationship. There is no relationship. Let me expand this and uh, uh, put it on full slide. So the null hypothesis, these hypotheses are formulated for testing statistical significance since this form is a convenient approach to <laughs> statistical analysis. So <clears throat> note that when you deal with hypotheses, you are dealing, I'm sorry, to keep on escaping, you are dealing with something called statistical significance. And uh, uh, Dr. Chesang will be teaching you statistics. So this is not the widely significance. This is the statistical significance. And there is a range at which something becomes statistically significant. But I want you to look at this. I want you to look at this, this example. This is a typical null hypothesis. Let me blow it up. A typical null hypothesis. Um, sorry. <clears throat> And I'm going to blow it up. Like this. This is a typical null hypothesis. There is The example of a relationship with that there's a relationship between family income and expenditure. Oh my God, I keep forgetting. There's a relationship between family's income and expenditure on recreation. A null hypothesis may state there is no relationship between family's income level and expenditure on recreation. So it is telling us there is no relationship. In fact, correctly, if you are 
truly stating a null hypothesis, you would have said there is no significantly, there's no significantly, there's no significant relationship. And here I'm talking about statistical significant. So again, some people would want to say there's no statistically like that. There's no statistically significant relationship between families' income level and expenditure on recreation. So this would be a wonderful null hypothesis, which we would then go to the field to test. And it is telling us that there is no statistically significant relationship between families' income level and expenditure on recreation. I want you to note this. Every time you state an null hypothesis, remember the strong word is no relationship between the variables. And here the variables are family income and expenditure on recreation. So during Christmas, some families bought 10 loaves of bread to celebrate Christmas Day. Slaughtered a big goat, slaughtered 10 chicken, brought in fish. Obviously, the income level of that family is, is high. And that's why we are having a corresponding high expenditure on recreation. Uh, Boaz, Othello. Hello? Prof. Yes. Before you forget, I think uh, I just want to, 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 to get this more deeper. Yeah. What, what you are saying is null hypothesis simply rebuts what is essentially the ideological thing. No. The null hypothesis, here it looks very simple. But sometimes, as when we will be developing our proposals, you will not know whether that is the logical reasoning, that is the logical relationship. But the null hypothesis affirms that there is no statistical relationship between the variables in a study. Then you go and do the study and either reject or uphold the null hypothesis. Was Sorry, Prof. I think my hand was uh, oh, still oh, up oh, from the previous okay, okay. conversation. Yeah, sorry. Okay, that's okay. Um, Prof, anybody Prof, else? Yes, Prof, Prof, can I just say something about the null hypothesis? Please go uh, ahead. Okay, now, is it something, the null hypothesis, is this something that you deliberately uh, decide that this should be so, but in the back of your mind, you know that actually it's going to be put wrong. You, you go ahead and state that there's no relationship so that you can go and study. No, there are many null hypotheses, Othello, that we shall accept. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's not, it's not, you're not going to reject everyone. No, no, there are many we shall accept. But I, I, I want, as, as we wind up chapter three in research methodology, for every one of us to know that you're going to deal with a hypothesis if you're doing quantitative studies and you're going to meet the hypothesis but more importantly, you will have to know the two types, the main types, the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. Don't worry about these others that I've, I have uh, stated um, in, in my 
in my but just a minute. And uh, I would advise that uh, we don't become averse to statistics. We don't become averse to statistics. Um, and there's usually a tendency, the class feeling mentality, we don't come up as to statistics. Okay. Um, these other uh, types of hypotheses, you'll meet them later on. But the alternative hypothesis just say there is a relationship between family income and recreation expenditure. And you know, it can be also proved wrong because some people, some families are rich but very stingy. Yeah. There are people who are just stingy. So you can't say family in income will be related to big expenditures. So a good hypothesis, therefore, should have conceptual clarity. What are you talking about when you talk about performance or income or recreational expenditure? It must be specific. It must be testable. And um, you must have the techniques that will allow you to test the null hypothesis. There must be theoretical evidence uh, very important. You can't just talk about uh, a null hypothesis if you don't have the techniques to test for it. And um, consistency, objectivity, and simplicity will come into the details of those when we are handling your proposals uh, this semester. Where do you get hypothesis, uh, theory, uh, observation? So you have to do a lot of reading, analogies, intuition, personal experience, findings of studies that you'll have read, state of knowledge, culture, and of course, continuity of research. <clears throat> I just thought I would recap because I think I rushed through the hypothesis last time and it's a very important aspect. But those of us who will do qualitative studies, you don't want, you don't worry about hypothesis. You'll be talking about research questions and objectives. Now, um, I want to pause there and, and hear what is the feeling <clears throat> so far about hypothesis in the class, if any? If not, then we will continue. Othello. Yes, this is an area in research which we really need to be. Your, your, to be your sound is low, it's a bit low. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. My, okay, I'm saying that it's an area of research that we we have to be to be able to understand this particular uh, this particular area, especially hypothesis when it is relating to quantitative research. Uh, you need to be very grounded. And I was listening to those professors. I remember Prof, Prof when you were giving your inaugural lecture. Yeah, 2022. 
in those one of those professors was was to respond to the lecture and then we, because your presentation was about mixed methods so yes. i see these people are they have you have to be grounded in this research for you to know all these things you really have to be grounded so so i think it's a privilege for us to be in this class maybe my colleagues will be able to to see this i think during our last uh, last semester one of the colleagues was saying that they have never seen this picture i mean this, this out uh, approach on research they have done research before but now their mm -hmm. eyes were opening uh, when we got into this class so i'm just praying that uh, we are going to be from here we'll be grounded so long as we are going to uh, put ourselves bury ourselves in getting to understand this thing thank you okay thank you very much this is very kind comments but the the by the time that's why I asked to continue with you uh, this uh, semester to wrap up research, not to rush and say we are finished. Uh, just to be sure that you don't meet anything strange. If somebody is talking about assumptions, somebody is talking about rationale, somebody is talking about variables, uh, somebody is talking about statement of a problem, all those, you will know them. It will not be strange to you. Um, can we move on to Chris Wakesa? Thank you, Pro. Uh, the question was, how is the feeling? I wanted to confirm that personally, the recap has been so resourceful to me in particular because uh, I've been able to understand hypothesis in depth actually last semester i i have to to to, to admit that uh, i did not get it mm. but this time i have i've actually gotten it and thanks prof for okay. for the good one all right uh we want to move on in chapter three you will meet some people. Some people think it's very easy. It isn't. The various sampling methods. And um, sampling is the process of selecting a small number of elements from a larger defined target group of elements such that the information gathered from the small group will allow judgments to be made about the larger group. Now, let me just get this clear. Sampling is a process of selecting a small number of elements. When you see small number of elements, that's what you're going to call your sample. That is your sample. So you have to get a sample and we shall see the reasons why. From a larger target group of elements, the larger, so this small number refers to the sample. Then there will be a larger target group of elements. Larger target group of elements. This one. And uh, this is your population. That's your population. Your larger target is your population. But I, I, I'm avoiding using words like population because some of the terms, some of the things you're going to deal with, you have to see them in terms of elements. 
rather than a sample. And then you also must see them from a larger target group of elements which we call the population. But the important thing is this. The information gathered from the small group will allow judgments to be made about the larger group. What is this person saying? This person is saying that the sample is representative representative of the population. The sample is representative of the population. That's what they are saying. Uh, sorry. Uh, the sample is representative of the population. That's what we are saying there. So I and I, and I don't want these aspects, I repeat, I don't want these aspects memorized. Yeah. So what I'm saying is this. Sampling, you, you select small number of elements, the sample, from a larger target group of elements, the population, such that the information gathered from the small group will allow judgments to be made about the larger groups. In other words, the sample is representative of the population. And I really would like all of us to understand, because when you come to statistics with uh, Dr. Chesang, uh, there's a very strong relationship between sample and population. And that's where you're going to get those descriptive statistics of mean, mode, range, standard deviation, right up to other complex statistical indices. They start with the sample and the population. And the assumption is that the sample is representative of the population. Statistics therefore plays around with the representativeness of the sample to the population. And that's when we introduce the sampling error. If the sampling error is too big, then you are in trouble statistically. But we shall come that, to that later. I hope everybody uh, has a grasp of that, of what I've just said. So, Look at this, the basics of sampling theory. Prof, I have a question. Please. Yes, I, I think uh, between the sample and you're saying uh, in relation to what you don't want to call uh, as, as the population. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, it's reminding me then of uh, researching, for example, the issues or factors which uh, militated against uh, people uh, mm. accessing uh, primary education. Mm. And when, when, when then Kibaki declared that there'll be free primary education, mm. uh, then uh, people joined and various... Uh, categories of people joined, including very old people like uh, Kimani Maruge. Yeah. Uh, when when now you are looking for a representative sample? Yeah. How will your representative sample include Kimani Maruge? Yeah. Without That's losing his contribution. Very good question. So you see, that's what I'm saying. If you have too many of them, that's when they introduce the sampling error because the population will not be, the sample will not be representative of the population. But if it is just one Kimani, that old man in Nakuru, that is what we refer to 
in statistics as uh, a stray object, a stray object um, which lies on the periphery of the sample or even the population itself. So those, those are the things that then begin to give us a lot of challenges in statistics. Because uh, if there are too many, then the sampling error becomes very big and uh, there's no relationship between the sample and the population. But I'm glad you are, you are thinking like that. Because that, that, that is the type of thinking I expect at master's level. What happens? So which means you'll have to define, to operationalize whom you are defining by introducing the age cohort that is within your range of study. Good question. Um, so this is the basic thinking or the basics of sampling theory. When we deal with the population, sorry, when we deal with the population, uh, the element, what are you dealing with? You know, you can have a population of books, eh? types of books. You can have a population of dogs. You can have a population of black dogs or black chicken. So you have de to define the target population. You have to define the target population and then create a sampling unit. And that will constitute your sampling frame for your study. What am I saying? You are going to begin to get a lot of these things coming, these terms, when you are dealing with sampling theory. And I'm going to give you some notes after this on sampling because it is very significant that we get it right. I'll dictate some notes in the, the last hour of this lesson. Sampling error. Is any type of bias that is attributable to mistakes in either drawing a sample or determining the sample size? That is the sampling error. So the type of mistakes of you bringing in uh, elements that don't meet the criteria. And uh, my colleague in statistics will be teaching you the various types of sampling errors and uh, the calculations attendant to them. Developing a sampling plan. First of all, define the population of interest. So what is your population of interest? Is it primary school children between age eight and uh, 12? Is it grade chicken in uh, soy sublocation? Is it high school students? High school students uh, who have just finished the exam? Is it freshers in a university or is it master's students in the School of Arts? And then define a sampling frame. In other words, how are you going to put the limits of your sample? So in this population, my sampling frame, frame will be 
all freshers doing nursing and clinical medicine. Then you select a sampling method, and there are many we are going to look at today. Determine the sample size, and then execute the sampling plan. I would like everybody to have this developing a sampling plan. Please scribble those notes. Scribble those notes. And you have to be very careful when you, are, when you are defining the population of interest. Now, this is what I mean by defining population of interest. The population of interest is an entirely dependent on management problem, research problem, and the research design. So some basis of defining your population will include the geographical area, the demographics, the usage or, of, or lifestyle, and awareness. Prof, kindly <laughs> go back a slightly. Just let me think you. Where? There. Just a minute, kindly. Where we are? Are we okay here? Yes. One okay. minute. One minute. Right. Defining population. The population of interest. Thank you, Prof. Okay. And then the sampling frame. And I don't want you to sound strange in, in your defenses when somebody asks you, what is your sampling frame? It's a list of population elements, people, companies, houses, cities, from units to be, from which units to be sampled can be selected. So what is your sampling frame? Know that it's sometimes difficult to get an accurate list for various obvious reasons. And the sampling frame error occurs when certain elements of the population are accidentally omitted or not included on the list. Huh? 
and uh, I, I want to I want to make sure that we are we are getting it. You see, if you wanted to sample, for example, suppose you went to a school and you wanted to sample above average above above average uh, iq students in a school sorry in a school now you will get a lot of error if they have been sent away for fees. For example, they have been sent away for fees. And these, these above average are usually the ones who have a lot of problems. And then you sample them and you're just sampling the students and you go with the list away, there will be a very serious sampling error. Because certain elements of the population are accidentally omitted or not included on the list. So when you go to search for the sample size, you hit a snag. Please note that uh, I would like you to go to this site you see a survey sampling international for some good examples. And you should be able to use this. You should be able to use some of those examples when you are starting to prepare your proposal. So this is a, this is a valuable site. A valuable site. And uh, you just copy and paste in the browser, and you'll get you'll get to the site. Let's move on. Sorry. To sampling methods. There are basically two sampling methods, probability sampling and non-probability sampling. Probability sampling and non-probability sampling. And uh, please look at this. Probability sampling, simple random sampling. There is systematic random sampling. There is stratified random sampling, and there is cluster sampling. Non-probability sampling, we have um, convenience sampling, This is sometimes called judgmental or just or just judgment sampling. There is quarter sampling. 
and there is no ball sampling. In other words, when you are developing your proposal, you'll have to determine which sampling method are you going to use. And you don't have to use one sampling method. You can use two. You can use three in your study. But you have to understand them. Can I move on? A minute, just one minute. I'm okay, Prof. If others are okay, you can move. Are we are we comfortable with the speed? Yes, yes. Okay. Anybody struggling? I I hope we are all uh, getting there and now the first one is simple random sampling. Just note, we have looked at the various sampling methods, probability and non-probability, and now we go to simple random sampling, which most of us engage in. And this one just tell us that every element has equal opportunity of being selected or non-zero chance of being selected. And I'm giving notes like that. Systematic random sampling is a method of probability sampling 
in which the defined target population is ordered and the sample is selected according to position using a skip interval. Don't worry about that. I'm going to illustrate those things. Now, look at this. This is steps in drawing a systematic ramble, random sample. Obtain a list of units that contains an acceptable frame of the population. Determine the number of units in the list and the desired sample size. Compute the skip interval, I will explain. Determine a random start point. Begin at the start point, select the units by choosing each unit that corresponds to the skip interval. Suppose the target population suppose the target population was So determine the number of units in the list and the desired sample size. So suppose we're looking for from one boys and girls. from one boys and girls. So these are the students. And uh, please don't spend too much time copying, try to understand also. Suppose these were 300 girls. Determine the number of units in the list. These are from one boys and girls from this, this school. And uh, suppose the desired site sample was a hundred for months, hundred for months. Compute the skip interval. So if I want. 100 from once, it means the skip interval, for example, would be n 
equal to n equal to three. Suppose that is my skip interval. Determine a random, sorry, determine a random start point. I just want a hundred, so I can start at um, number six. Begin at the start point, select the units by choosing each unit that corresponds to the skip interval. So, can I have your attention here, here please? Um, we obtain a list that contains an acceptable frame of the target population. So we go into a school that has 300 high school students. <clears throat> we determine the number of units in the list, and that's from one, boys and girls, and the desired sample size is 100. We compute the skip interval. This is n is equal to three. So we start, we start at student, we line them up and we start with student at number six. Number six will be our first element. So if the skip interval is three, it will be, we have taken number six. So seven, eight, nine. Nine becomes our second element. Then 10, 11, 12, because our skip interval is three, that becomes our third element. We do that until we have a hundred boys and girls. And obviously you have to put two lines of boys and girls. So you select 50 and then 50 boys, 50 girls. When you add them, you have a hundred. But you must have a constant skip interval. This skip interval must be such that it will give you the desired sample size from the population. So it can it can also be this skip, skip interval can also be two. Why not? I can still from this if I start at number six, seven eight that becomes number one. Nine ten. Number two, 11, 12, number three. And I do the same for the line on boys and the line on girls. That is called systematic random sampling. It is not like this one. It's not like this one, where you, you pick, you either give them pieces of paper, numbered one to 100, one, uh, one to 300, and you pick 100. Or you put them in a kofia and you pick 100. It's not that, it's not a simple random sampling. Othello, go ahead. Prof, what about obtaining a list of the, from the registrar? And then mm. you do that kind of, yeah, you go through the, with, with that, the numbering uh, that you, you just shown to us there. What is the same? Get the list. Yeah. Uh, that that will be the sampling frame from the registrar. If you went into a school, huh? you are going to use the sampling frame from the admissions office. That's okay. That's okay. Anybody else? Yes, Prof. Brian. So here. please. Note. Yes, Brian. Brian Wender. Um. I'm just looking at that page that you just displayed and I wanted to ask you a question. Um, mm. If you pick if you pick a number larger than the skip interval, wouldn't you not be able to like reach the number that you wanted, the, the, the quorum that you, you wanted? If you pick if you pick a number larger than the skip interval, like 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 the six you had picked. 
you may you may no, not I don't be think it's six it was three Oh, so uh, um, no, the start point. The start point being larger than the skip interval. Yeah, the start point being larger than the skip interval. That's this. That's the case here now. Or good. Yes, that's why I'm asking. You will not be able to reach a hundred people if you do that. And on the second point, when you're picking, um, yes, that that was my question. Sorry. If because I when, you, at, when you start at number six and then skip three, 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 you will reach a hundred people at let's say three or six, unless you still have to refer back to the six people that you skipped in the first place. No, no, no. I have three hundred students lined up. Yes. I determine the number of units in the list. A hundred. Oh. A hundred. You see. Yeah. And uh, uh, the the number of units in the these are from one boys and girls. From one boys and girls are not a hundred. Yeah, My sample is a hundred. Yeah. No, that maybe there are a hundred and fifty more from once. But I, but what you are engaged in is very useful when you are doing systematic random sampling. You must worry: Will I get my sample size? I think that's the most important point you're bringing out. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I but, can, no, can, no. Maybe, can I come in? Okay, maybe he's thinking yeah, that... Come in, number come, six, in, come in. He's thinking that that number six there, it is the... the you When you come from six, you are going to another six. Six is a starting point because you are, you are, you are skip interval is three. So no, the no, next no. number after three will be six. That is why. No, uh, yeah, no, no that was not my question. And actually, mm -hmm. if you write this on paper, and and your skip interval is three, and you, and and you start at number six, you will actually not be able to get a hundred people if you continue skipping threes because you you started at number six, not. You should have started yeah. at one, two, or three for you to be able to reach a hundred people. Yeah, I like I like that reasoning, eh? but you are you're making an assumption that uh, the population is equivalent to the desired sample. Are you getting it? You are assuming, uh, yeah. Uh, if I have three hundred and I start at number six, and 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 if I'm dividing between boys and girls, I'm not even sure whether you'll have to find out whether the ratio is one to one of boys and girls. There's a lot of statistics you have to think through. And that is why I'm saying your question is good because it allows for that thought process. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Good. Let's, let's carry on. Stratified random sampling is a method of probability sampling in which the population is divided into different subgroups and samples are selected from each. So very important, like the example we have just done, can you strat stratify your population into boys and girls? Those are two strata, boys and girls. And then now do either random sampling or systematic random sampling. But here they're just saying, stratify them, boys and girls, and then divide in those two groups and select the sample that you're looking for randomly. So Frank Onchan and uh, Taslin, that is good thinking so that you are within your population sample.
look at drawing a stratified sample, divide the target population into two homogeneous subgroups or strata, boys and girls, draw random samples from each stratum, combine the samples from each stratum into a single sample of the target population. So that, that one is very simple. Uh, Stella, then Othero. Uh, good evening. Uh, my question is on the sample size. What formula do you use to come up with the sample size? We shall come to that. Um, the <laughs> I don't like telling students that, but generally most people relate <clears throat> sample size to 30% of the population. It is not true. So there will be <clears throat> a, a method, a statistical method of determining the sample size, which I'll mention, but we also meet in statistics. But I think the thumb of the rule walk with around 30% of your population. Okay. Othello? I just mistakenly left okay. my hand. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. okay. Now, cluster sampling. This is where natural groupings are evident in a statistical population. So you divide the population into comparable groups. Cluster sampling is to reduce the average cost by interview. And uh, you have to be very careful uh, from cluster sampling, clusters. So if you are doing a cluster sample, uh, of schools, you would uh, take schools in one sub county or some location, one location as a cluster, then you sample from there randomly and then go to another location. Those are clusters, it becomes cheaper, but it has its own. Uh, shortcomings, particularly when there are variation in the population is within the groups. That can be a big problem with cluster sampling. But I want you to learn that it's a form of sampling that is uh, commonly used. Yeah. If you are a, an, a keen researcher, you should see the limitations of cluster sampling. So that is probability sampling. And uh, I would like to pause there.
I'm still here. I'm trying to get something to show you. Um, I don't know whether you can see this clearly, a little small, but let me see what I can do. These are the known probability sampling. Here you don't use probability, you just sample. And it has many limitations, but I would like you to appreciate them. I hope you can see those a little more clearly. Um, copy this. So, There we are. So copy those, then we shall go with through them. So, Brian Mwenda, read us the first non-probability sampling method. Convenience sampling relies upon convenience and access. Yes. So, you want to study performance in a high school. Uh, you look at access. So, if you are teaching at Rongo High School, you say, but this is a typical high school. So you set up your sampling frame there, you do your, your sampling and you say, I want to study uh, the performance of science in this school. 
because it is accessible. You can see statistically there's a problem. Uh, there are a lot of statistical bias in that sampling method, convenience sampling methods. Uh, Carolyn Dunge, the second method. So judgment sampling relies upon belief that participants fit characteristics. Yeah, so you, you use your judgment sampling mm -hmm. and you believe that uh, they'll carry the characteristics. <clears throat> so if you want to, to, to do a study on mechanics, uh, your judgment tells you that most mechanics in most towns are Luos. So you sample uh, mechanics and uh, you believe that uh, the characteristics of good mechanics are from Luos, so you only go and interview Luos, for example. Um, Eugene, the third. Water sampling emphasizes representation of specific characteristics. Yeah, so you, you look for specific characteristics. For example, um, if you want to do quarter sampling, you, you want representation of certain characteristics. So, for example, you want to sample early pregnancies. and school dropout. So you use the quota sampling, you isolate, and you are running after specific characteristics. Quota sampling is not the same as stratification. It's very different. You pick a characteristic, that is represent, representative of the a specific aspect that you're looking for. Uh, you can do quota sampling during the post-election violence. So you do quota sampling in a particular camp and you're looking for a particular tribe and the age profile. Florence Macchio, snowball. Next. Snowball sampling relies upon respondent referrals of others with like characteristics. Yes. Um, you are looking for boys who went to Chavakali High School in Kakamega County. You get one boy, and then you ask him to help you find another Chavakali old boy. So they are referring you. Then you go to that one. Then that one will give you another one. So it's like creating a snowball, which starts very small, but by the time it is rolling down the hill, it is growing bigger and bigger. That's why it's called snowballing. Yes, uh, how many of us went through Alliance High School, Alliance Boys High School? in uh, 2010. How do I get them? Snowballing. Start with one, gives you the second, the second gives you the third, or the third gives you the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh, like that. So that is sampling. And you're looking for certain characteristics from that group. Um, 
Esther Jen, please read us convenience numbers. Hello. Yes. Oh, uh, let me begin. Convenience samples. Samples drawn at the convenience of the interviewer. I think samples drawn at the convenience of the interviewer. People tend to make the selection at familiar locations and to choose respondents who are like the who are like themselves. Yeah, so this one carries Should I continue? No, no, that carries a lot of bias. Convenience sample or convenience sampling. Uh faith Nzuki. Judgment samples. Is Faith there? She's not there. Festus, the Paraco. Judgment samples, samples that require a judgment or an educated guess on the part of the interviewer as to who should represent the population. Also, judges, in bracket informed individuals, may be asked to suggest who should be in the sample. Yeah. So, judgmental. Again, a good student of research should know that that is introducing a lot of bias. Uh, Evans, Lusasi, quarter samples. Chami, Francis, are you there? Yes, Prof. Yes. Hello, Prof. Yes, go ahead. I'm here. Quota samples. Mm. Samples that uh, set a specific number of certain types of individuals to be interviewed. Yeah. So you 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 divide them into quarter, not one over four into quarter samples. Uh, Ruth Ngosi. Are you there? Yes. Yeah. Um, snowboarding sampling is a technique for developing a research sample where existing study subjects Recruit feature subjects from among their acquaintances. Yeah. So, so you you grow a big snowball, starting with uh, known acquaintances. Uh, there have been very interesting studies when people are doing when we are doing when HIV was prevalent. Uh, snowballing was the most effective way. But you know, there are ethical issues also you will have to grapple with. Uh, why? Who told you that I have this or this condition? So very, very important to, to, to be careful in those ethical issues. Uh, factors to consider in sample design Please make sure you have this down. Research objectives, resources, knowledge of target population, degree of accuracy, time frame, research scope, and statistical analysis needs. So when you are doing sampling, you have to consider all these. And some of you are quiet now. Then I'll put this in a multiple choice type of question. Then trouble begins. Did he say this? Was this one this? No, no it can't be this. Huh?
very important to know the objectives of your research, the degree of accuracy, the time frame, the resources, the knowledge of the target population, the research scope, and then the kind of statistical analysis that will be required. Prof, we can rest assured that after this, when we are talking about statistical things, things involving mm -hmm. a lot of numbers, we can be sure that very many, many, many people will take to qualitative. <laughs> yeah, but, but sampling is a very important aspect. That's why I'm going to give you literature. I'm going to give you notes from my book. And I want you to read those notes to consolidate what we have done and then give me a synopsis. Very important. I want us to pause at data collection. So I want us to get ready. We're going to do speed writing, part of graduate work. Write understanding populations and sampling. Understanding populations and sampling. And uh, this is uh, I cannot overemphasize the importance of sampling in, in research. So what I'm going to do is I'll give you part one of the work, understanding populations and sampling. So we are stopping at that collection. We've done the sampling, but I need to emphasize Is this, can you see this? Are we able to see this? Yes. On your screens, please. 
Yes. Yes. Okay. I just want to give you some peep into what the, the kind of ideas I would like to see develop in your mind and uh, sampling. Um, so more lean, are you there? And remember, this is recorded. This is part of your participation. Maureen, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, please uh, take us through the first paragraph. Um, so, in your skeleton of sampling, but now I'm giving you the meat. From introduction. Yes. The practice of sampling is one of the most no, important. No, 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 no. You're a master student. Understanding populations and sampling. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's go. Objectives. Determine the population for their study. Know the different types of sampling techniques. Determine an appropriate sampling strategy for their study. So, introduction. The practice of sampling is one of the most important parts of the study. Another very important aspect of conducting research is that the researcher needs to decide how to conduct a sample of a population. When the researcher has to conduct sampling, there are many types and categories of sampling that need to be considered. Based on your research methodology, different sampling methods need to be used. Consider that qualitative research typically focuses on a different form of sampling compared to a quantitative method. The researcher has to consider different sampling methods depending on the particular methodology. For example, you would not consider using purposeful sampling with a quantitative study or using random sampling with a qualitative study. Sampling has rules that need to be understood by the researcher. Should I continue? Yeah, but I want us to pause a little. This is important. Uh, you would not consider using purposive sampling with a quantitative study. No. A quantitative study, you require a large population. So it can be purpose, purposeful or convenience sampling. Or you can't use random sampling with a qualitative study. You can't sample. You have to go and uh, sit in the situation to study a particular phenomenon. And so you, 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 you need purposive convenience sampling if you are doing a, co a qualitative study. This should be running through your mind. Go on. Sampling is frequently employed to estimate the sizes of populations, groups, and other types of populations. The practice of sampling has so many more uses for research. When researchers gather information obtained from properly selected populations, it can give rise to an interesting sample. Pause. There is... Yes, this. So you see, this is very important. When researchers gather information obtained from properly selected populations, it can give rise to an interesting sample. So the sample must be representative of the population. So if I was doing a notation, I would have highlighted, and then I would insert here that the sample must be representative of the population. Carry on. The researcher must remember that the sample is selected from the sampling frame 
which is a list of all the units from a population to be surveyed. Consider that the sampling frame will contain all the units of the population under consideration, which includes the target population. For example, many qualitative method texts offer valuable types of sampling methods. Consider the theoretical sampling method. This aspect of theoretical sampling refers to data gathering directed by emerging concepts. With theoretical sampling, the researcher follows the process of the trailing of concepts, looking for sites, persons, or events that will enable further comparisons of data. Yeah, so this is this is purposive, as it were. Um, Juliet Otieno. Okay, there are okay. There are different terms that need uh -huh. to be in. Sorry, uh, you are not with us, are you? You. We start from where that where she stopped. Comparisons of data. Yeah, my laptop is yeah. having a problem. Let me just uh, try to adjust it. Sorry, Sawa. In this chapter, Can I... we provide. Oh yeah, yeah, we are there in now. This... Okay, in this chapter, we provide an introduction to many elements associated with sampling methods and define the basic terminology and underlying principles of sampling. The chapter goes on to explain sampling strategies and approaches to both quantitative and qualitative methodologies. The chapter also provides an introduction to sampling techniques to identify the differences between groups and populations. Population. Okay. Oh. Uh, uh, my students note that in this description now, I am very, I'm very, I'm very deliberate. I'm now relating the sampling to the strategy, to the design. So I'm um, now, you can see, I'm bringing in time, I'm talking about sampling strategies. I am talking about appropriate to both quantitative and qualitative methodologies. And that's why we are doing chapter three. That's where you find sampling. Uh, so be very careful, see where we are going. Continue reading, Otien. There are, there are different terms that need to be introduced before we get into the finer points of sampling. There are some terms and definitions that need to be underscored. A population is defined as an aggregate of units such as people, households, cities, districts, countries, states, or provinces. It is also an entire group of people events or things of interest that the researcher wishes to investigate. That is Rao 2000, Upton and Cook 2008, Sekaran and Boogie 2013, Yaremko et al 2013. A population yeah, under- so, so just a minute, so note the class, note. That's why I was talking about elements. So when you talk about a population, a population, we are not just talking about people. It can be households, it can be cities, it can be districts, counties, countries, states, and so on, uh, or even events or things of interest. So you must open up your mind of what a population is. Carry on, sorry, Tian. carry on. It's okay. A population may be homogeneous or heterogeneous. Apana, apana. Sorry? Okay, Rudy. sorry. Yes, I'm there. A population under investigation depends on the nature of the investigation. A population may be homogeneous or heterogeneous. A population can be homogeneous when its every element is similar to each other in all aspects and when its elements are not similar to each other in all aspects. Yeah, the so variable. 
Yeah. Okay. I proceed? Yeah. Okay. The variables that make a population heterogeneous can vary greatly from research to research. Common variables that make a population heterogeneous are gender, age, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and so on. That is ZDEC 1996, LV 2016. So just pause. Just pause, heterogeneous. Uh, 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 these are the common variables. Uh, and, and you should see why that is so. Because gender is heterogeneous population. Nowadays, we used to talk of men and women. Now we have other people there also. Age, ethnicity, like in Kenya, almost 45 entities. Social economic status, people living in Lavington, and people living in Madare or Gorogocho, and so on. These are populations, but these are the common variables. Um, Anne Kinyaru, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. A target population yes. is defined is defined as a collection of, of elements or objects that possess the information sought by the researcher and about which inferences are to be made. An element is a single entity of any given population which is not decomposable further. An element may be... Yeah. Uh uh, pause. Pause. An element is a single entity of any given population which is not decomposable. Father, the key. What is this person saying? Is the key there? It's very serious when you are called and you're not recorded as being present. Eh? Sarah Gachi, are you there? Sorry, Professor. Wow. Okay. Yes. Sarah, what is that element? What is that statement in blue? Is it green or bluish? It's bluish. Uh, sky blue. What does it mean? Or give me an example of uh, an element in a given population. Are you able... Sanya, you have something to say? We just wanted to give an example. Yeah, give us an example of, please. of an element uh, of an element uh, an element an element is a, a cell is it something like a cell that makes up tissues mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. of course in this context we can say a tissue can be disintegrated down up to into uh, the the smallest unit known as a cell which, which in our case, as far as the population is concerned, it is an element. Mm. And the cell is not decomposable further. Yes. Yeah. Anybody else with an example? An element. We want to familiarize ourselves. We don't want to sound strange. Prof, um, I'm thinking uh, the example you were using previously of if you want to do some research uh, based on students who attended Chavakali High School. Yeah. Chavakali High School becomes an element. It cannot be anything else. It still remains Chavakali High School. Mm. Uh -huh. I thought, yeah. So if Chavakali High School is an element, your study population is, is what? Prof. No, Sanya, first. If Chavakali High School is an element, you're not wrong, but what is the study population? 
Can I try? Yes. Who is that? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, let me see. Taslim. <laughs> Taslim. The one is only Taslim. Okay. Taslim. Yes, if Chavakali High School is an element, then you can say that maybe high schools in uh, the Western region uh, mm. is the population or are the population, yes. Yes, but but uh, you people are leading, you're not, you're, you're leading yourselves astray. Were we, were we studying Chavakali High School or we were studying... Prof. Kanatra. The student <laughs> Lawrence. Let's listen from Florence Machu. So we are saying an element is a single entity of any given population, which is not the composable father. So if we looked at uh, gender in the old way, uh, I know, Prof, you have talked about the other characters now. Uh, if we look at it, male and female, and we are, want to focus on female, uh, then we can't decompose that element further. Uh, beyond female. Yeah. Very good. But I want, I'm interested in the Chavakali. When I okay, gave the so, example of Chavakali, so was to read Chavakali, uh, who is that? Is it Madian? No, this is Othello. Uh, okay. What, what okay. I was saying there is exactly what Florian was talking about. Uh, you, in, in your earlier statement, you talk about studying uh, uh, in, in the high school both male and female. So now you split them into two, male and female. Then you put a female in one group, the, the, the male in one group, and then you are now, you focus on a female, just what Florence was talking about. So it cannot be decom uh, decomposable further because it's already female you are studying in, in okay. these two groups in the high school. Thank you. And you are all running away from the Chavakali example. Madian. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. So for the Chavakali High School, though I had another uh, example. If um, our study is of the population in uh, Chavakali High School, an element may be an individual student who mm. is in Chavakali High School. Yeah. Probably to you could break it down if you could say prefects in Chavakali High School as another subpopulation. An individual prefect would now be an element um, whom we cannot break down further into something else. Okay, good. Now give me another example. Okay. So I wanted to say, for example, if we were studying a population of women in Chama, women um, in Chamas, mm -hmm. and um, we have quite a number of Chamas, maybe 40, in, mm. Oh, let me let me make it uh, even better. Study of women in Chama in Homa Bay, mm. and and even better, study of women in registered Chamas in Homa Bay, mm. and there are forty registered women's groups, and mm. Madiang's mother is in one of the Chamas. Mm. Therefore my mother would be an element in the study of the population of women in registered Chama groups in Homer Bay. Thank you very Robert. much. Uh, ladies and gen gentlemen, are, are you seeing how we are deepening our understanding of sampling? When I was talking about element and population without examples, it looked very theoretical. And this is how you deepen your conceptualization of research methods. Uh, and this is the approach we are using. If you get into this now, PhD would be a walk up. I'm telling you. You'll be so surprised. Because now, you don't even have to memorize what an element is, what a population is. And see what I'm doing to this paper. This is what the assignment I'm giving you for today. We, we are just finishing with this paragraph up to here. But this is what I'm giving the assignment and it will be done online. You will highlight important concepts, information 
And then you will come in the margin. You will come in the margin of, of that document. And I expect you, sorry, I expect you to go in the margin of that document. What am I doing? <clears throat> I expect you to go to the margin of that document and uh, you should go into that document and uh, if you are here, you then go to new comment and you insert the comment. So what, does, what would you write here? An element is a single entity of a given population which is not decomposable further. So what I would expect a student to do in the margin is to say, for example, definition of element, definition of element, and then not decomposable. I don't know whether you're seeing not decomposable further. This is highlighting, this is annotation. And by the time you go through a document like this, doing this, you, you have mastered without memorizing a lot of the concepts around understanding remember the topic is understanding population and sampling so like here i would highlight this and i would come here uh, sorry i've not yet entered this i should have entered this uh, um this one i should have sent it like that so i would come here on population and do this this and then comment here. And then write population dash types. Yes, population dash types. So after you've done that, you can enter population dash types you have entered and uh, you'll have done your annotation. And of course you send it, you send it so that it is, when I click on it, I'll see what you've done. So this will be in the margin. I, I would like to see a paper highlighted and annotated. Uh, uh, can somebody complete who was reading for us? Do you remember who you are? Yes, I remember. It's Anne. Anne, yes. Carry on. An element may be an individual, a household, a factory, a marketplace, a school, etc. What an element is going to be depends on the nature of the population. An pause. element is... Pause. Pause. Are you seeing why I've been uh, harassing you about Chabakali? Uh, I hope you see why I was harassing you about Chawakali. Because you can see there is an individual, the prefect, or the form four go to first division, but there is also a school, Chabakali. So Chabakali can be an element also. Depending on whether you're dealing with schools, or then the individual becomes an element if you're dealing with the students who left Chabakali. So, a good student, uh, can one of you tell me what would you annotate? By the way, annotation, I hope you know you go to review, then you get the new comment. What, what would you say there? What would you, what, what would you ask me to, to type here? What an element is going to be depends on the nature of the population.
What what would you type there? Hello, Prof. Good evening. Prof. Good evening. Please tell me who you are. My name is, my name is Nyawita. What I will type there is hmm. element hyphen determinant. Element hyphen. hyphen yes. Determinant. Uh -huh. Yeah, because what determines what an element is, is the nature of the population. Mm. Thank you. Very good. Anybody else would have said something different? We can't say all the same thing. And that's what Masters is all about. Uh, a trial? Prof? An element is a trial? Yes. Mm. This is Chris Wakesa. Uh, I would say element hyphen dependent, and then I would say on population, the nature of population. So you would say element, yes, element hyphen dependent mm -hmm. on nature, yes. And then, then I would say on nature of the population. Yeah, that's what I've written. All right. So, so are we seeing we are deepening our conceptualization of population and sampling without sitting down to memorize things? Sisiki, what do you mean? Carry on. Yes. Yeah, carry on the reader. And this time I'm only I'm going to give you very few assignments. And they will count for many marks. Carry on. Our reader, Maina. An element is also defined as a single member, member of the population. Yes. Think of a census as Just a count. Just look at this. Group. Look at this one. Just a minute. This one. An element is also defined as a single member of a population. I shouldn't have put that in, in, in should put this in this color. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Think of a census as a count of all the elements in the human population. Malhotra et al. 2013, Alvi 2016, Sekara Ned Boji 2013. A census involves a complete enumeration of the elements of a population or study objects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so I, I expect you to do this here. I expect you to, to do this. Uh, what do I do here? Uh, a census is a involves a complete enumeration of uh, the population. So I would expect you to, to, to tell me what do you mean by a census is a complete enumeration of a population of a study. So I would say this, um, if I was doing this study, I would then say census, yeah, dash population. Yes. And then I would say uh, if I put here dash, if I put there dash and say sample, what should come before the dash? Like that. We can say enumeration. Eh? For population. Can we say enumeration? No. Enumeration is counting. Census is to count everybody. Yeah. And how about element? That is for a population. How about a sample? Sample, yes. It's what? Yes. Why are you not sure? Yeah, it is what it is. 
sample, which is the element actually. It is sampling. Census you get is for the population. Sampling gives you a sample. I'm trying to open up your minds, please. I, and I hope um, I have some disciples in this class, or all of you are my disciples, anyway. Um, so you need to be careful. Finally, as we finish the lesson for today, uh, I, 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 I would like Francis Ochami to do for us this paragraph, then we shall stop for tonight. I am going to send you this document. And you have seen what we are doing, and that will be your assignment one. Annotation and highlight. This is, this is how I want you to read your journal articles. You read, the only way I know you have read a journal article is highlighting, using your highlighter and annotation. Then now we shall begin to develop our proposals. Ochami. Yes, Prof. So before Ochami comes in, so this is part of our assignment, isn't it? The, the one we have already done. Yes. <laughs> which one? You will, you will leave this one there. It's no. Which, which one? <laughs> <laughs> the one we have already done. You see, if, if you try to preserve yourself. The one you are highlighting. Yeah. But if you try to preserve yourself. People want to be like Lot's wife. <laughs> you know what will happen if you try to preserve yourself you lose yourself <laughs> i have no problem if you want to use this some of some of but i expect you to read and internalize this in a different way let's listen to ochami and ochami just read very quickly that last paragraph i'm going to send you a document of about 10 pages on sampling and you have to do what we are doing now carry on Ochami, are you there? You're not there. Prof, I'm here. Okay. All right. Um, for, can be defined as a subgroup of the elements of the population selected for participation in the study. Sampling is also defined as the selection of some part of aggregates or totality on the basis of which a judgment or inference about the aggregate or totality is made. Is made. Yeah. So this one, just a minute. Uh, read, read the authors. We need to respect them. Go ahead, read the authors. All right, let me just pick it again so that I, I read the author. So, okay. um, it's also defined as the selection of some part of an aggregate or totality on the basis of which a judgment or inference about the aggregate or totality. Upton and Cook, two thousand and eight. Yeremenko et al. 2013. Hack ND. What does ND mean? No date. Yeah, it's coming. Now, what what would you put here? I'm not going to highlight, but what would you I'm not going to annotate. What would you put here? And this is very simple. Me, I would uh, say sampling. Oh, sorry, Madian. What would you say? I think one of my highlights would say sampling uh, definition. Sampling definition. Mm -hmm. uh, is that? Is that yes, sampling definition? But me, I, would not, I think I've okay. seen something there. All right. I I think I've seen something there. Uh that tells me sampling represents the population. Totality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, can can we say sampling a representation of population? Yeah. So, so you say so much totality. This, yeah, totality is the total, the population, the aggregate. So then I would be okay, right. Carry on. Then I would be right to say, Prof, mm -hmm. sampling uh, dash mm -hmm. 
definition totality. What is going on? Mm -hmm. If 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 it makes sense, carry on, Chami. A sample is a relatively small group of people selected from a population for investigation purposes. The members of the sample are called participants. A sample is measured to make generalizations about populations. In other, in pause, uh -huh. pause. Okay. That is very important. Very very important. Yeah. And I want to leave it like that. Members of the sample are called participants. A sample is measured to make generalizations about the population. Carry on so that we finish the lesson. In order, I don't know if it meant in other words. <laughs> yeah, in other words, yeah. Mm. In other words, a sample is a subpopulation. It is comprised of members selected from the population. Some, but not all, of the elements of a population form the sample. Sekaran and Buji, 2013. A sampling unit is an element or set of elements that is available for selection at some stage of the sampling process. Some examples of sampling units in a multi-stage sample are city blocks, households, and individuals within those households. A subject is considered a single member of the sample, just as an element is a single member of the population. Alvi 2016, Malhotra et al. 2013, Sekaran and Wuji 2013. A sampling okay, frame. Okay. No, no, stop, stop there. Um, and I hope, I hope that uh, uh, this is really making sense for all of us. Uh, I want to leave the rest. I'm going to assemble the whole chapter. Uh, from my book so that I, I can uh, I can see uh, the people I am bringing up uh, the intellectual nurturing that I'm looking for and so after you've done this and this is the assignment for now and next week next week you are aware I leave the country on Friday for one week I'll come back the other Monday, 30th, 31st. So my class, my class on research next week is actually supposed to be a Thursday. I've borrowed Kegode's class. He'll come in my class. I don't know when Caro is bringing him. So my class for that week, this is what you will do. Understood? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Don't, don't ask again. And please, you have enough time, you have the whole of next week to deepen your understanding of population and sampling. Then I'll go to data collection and data analysis. And then I'll be satisfied that we can now draw, do our proposal of chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three. So Next week, that time, you will concentrate on this work. And you can start working on it slowly. Highlighting and annotation. Highlighting and annotation. And then what we are going to do is I'm going to mark this work. And then I'll pick the best and the worst. The best... <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, the, the sampling frame will <laughs> pick, the, <laughs> will pick the best the three one. and the worst three to present in class. Hey. Okay. Yeah. This is our class. Whatever we do here remains here. Yeah. Yes, prof, so, prof, prof, I have a question kindly. Yes, please, yes. Uh, I want to ask, are you going to mark exactly on the same document where we're supposed to do the yes. annotation or will we simply yeah. have a, a plain document and then we we'll simply choose uh, for ourselves where to do the annotation? No, no, no. It will be just what I've done. This document I'm going to send you will not have these annotations. I had somebody saying, so we shall have, we shall use this. You know, you, you're not going to have this. You're going to have a clean document. Each one of you. 
Carol will distribute it. Okay, I mean, Prof, I mean, uh, are you going to mark mm -hmm. exactly where we're supposed to do, the, to do the annotation or it will simply be as plain as it will be so that we'll have a choice of uh, annotating any of the sentences, any of the paragraphs? No, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to tell you where you're going to annotate. Okay. No, no, it will just be plain. Yeah? Uh, prof. Uh, yes, thank yes. You. Uh, Help uh, me sorry. explain. Boaz, can you help me explain to this uh, fellow? I think you have explained it. You have said it is, uh, our, it is our choice uh, yeah. to see where to annotate and all that. Highlight mm. and annotate. Mine was a different question. Mm. In, case, in case you are through with that, the other one. Yeah, I'm through with that. Okay. okay. Uh, mine was uh, just uh, then attempting to wonder if... Uh, in the process then of highlighting and doing the annotations, uh, you, you also have a feeling that you a critique of, of yes. the parts. Would that wonderful. be part of the issue? Yeah, wonderful. And, 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 and it's a good idea. I don't want to, don't feel committed. At the end, you can, you can do a synopsis or a critique. Let's, let's see it. Yeah. But uh, it's a critique, not to criticize Oruku. You know, this is your this is your lecturer's book. <laughs> we are just learning. I think the, the, we are learning and doing everything in good faith. I know, I know. I've known who, from, who buried in my academia, own day, what, as they say. That's what we encourage. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, I've enjoyed the class. I hope you learned something uh, around um, hypothesis and now the major thing, population and sampling. We have uh, next time I'll finish data collection and data analysis. And then we now start developing our chapters. And as we develop, we shall we shall review our theory where there are weaknesses. I know, like for example, in literature review, I did not cover the APA uh, reference. Have time, but I know areas where there are still gaps. But I want to fill them when we are doing the practice. Madiang. Uh, thanks, Prof. Uh, was, uh, just yeah, just a question. Is your book yeah. out last time you were struggling with the publishers? Is it out? It is, it is, I hope it is it is out next month. I hope. Okay, but keep I us informed. Yeah, I'll keep you informed. I hope everybody for my class on Thursday, I hope everybody has the leadership book. Everybody, because that will be our class text. So please get it from Caro and Grace from my office. Uh, Pay it direct to the publisher, East African Education Publishers. And uh, you, you should have each a copy. That will be our class text. And anytime you are quoting leadership, that will be your reference. But I'll, So I'll be doing presentations uh, on, on uh, PowerPoint, on leadership, on, on um, uh, dysfunctions of teams, on emotional intelligence, and then we go to the chapters in the book yeah, for group work and so on. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will not be with you next week. I have given you assignment for this research. I'll give you an assignment on leadership on Thursday, God willing. Uh, so you have work while I'm away for the week, uh, going to look for money for our university. Mbariki uh, wasan, and God bless all of you. Good night. Well, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may you go well. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord go ahead of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. travel. Good night, everyone.
Lady Mulale, good night. I hope Mandy has maintained your chin. I didn't get it, so I hope you are good. Good night. Tutauliza tena kesho assign.